Praise the Lord. Everybody, I said, Praise the Lord. Let's close our eyes for prayer. I want you to commit yourself to the Lord in prayer as you prepare yourself to hear everything the Lord wants to teach us. I didn't say just meditate, I said pray. Let the Lord hear you pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. Thank you for bringing us together so you can do us good. We're asking, Lord, that everything you have for us today will sink into every heart in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, the study will be a blessing to everyone. Confirm it, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome everyone to our Bible study tonight. We're looking at Mark chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 14. Mark chapter 1, reading from verse 14. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to be calm fishers of men. And straightway they pursued their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther thence, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother who also were in the sheep mending their nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the sheep with the hired servants and went after him. Those are the verses we're looking at today. And it talks about the conversion of the first disciples and their call into the ministry. Will you notice that as Jesus went out, he saw these sinners. They had not known the Lord at that time. Normal, ordinary sinners. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But he didn't see them or meet them or reach them in a synagogue, in a sanctuary, in a temple. He saw them at work. And at work he reached out to them and he called them to himself. The disciples then were saved and they were called outside the sanctuary. Very important. As you look at the New Testament, you find quite a number of the disciples and quite a number of believers who were reached out to and who were touched, who were transformed, who were converted outside a temple. In the place they were walking, in the place they were doing whatever 
the Lord met them and he called them. And the same thing we should still notice today, that many people can still be saved outside the synagogue, outside the sanctuary, outside the temple. And anywhere we go, like Jesus Christ went, the side of the sea, at a bus stop, in a taxi, in a bus, anywhere outside the church auditorium, we reach out to them with the gospel of Christ, with the good news of salvation, and salvation can be theirs and will be theirs in Jesus' name. Another thing we notice is that they were not idle. It was when they were busy at their secular employment that they were called to a higher service, a spiritual service, a higher life, a greater fellowship, and a greater learning and training. And they came into service, into the engagement of the work of the kingdom of God. And so we learn that when people are called to salvation, at the same time we need to tell them they're coming to the kingdom of God for a purpose and for a reason. And that reason will make clear to them so that they will know it's not just that I'm saved, I'm born again, I've repented, I've come to the Lord. There's a reason why they have come to the Lord. And we need to emphasize to them that to fellowship with the people of God and that to feed on the watch of God and that to serve the Lord and that to use their strength and their skill, everything they have now, since the Lord has called them, that to use everything for the glory of the Lord. This passage I read to you now in Mark is also recorded in Matthew. And in Matthew, we have some extra details that are given to us. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4, I'm reading here from verse 17, the same story, but then you see some additions and you see some amplifications, some explanations, some words uh, Mark left out. In, Ma in Matthew chapter 4 verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, sought two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. It says they were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. They were fishermen. And he says unto them, follow me, come after me. As Mark has recorded it, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Then he goes on to say in verse 20, and they straightway left their nets, and they followed him. He called them, and they responded immediately. They responded without wasting time. They responded without delay. They responded to the word of God. The moment they had that word from the word personified from the Lord Jesus Christ. What an example for us. What an encouragement for us. And what an evidence that we actually believe the word of God. We accept the word of God. And as he calls, then we follow. And we should do it promptly like they did it. They followed him straightway. They left everything. Look at verse 21. And going on from this, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a sheep with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. They were mending their nets. They had finished the work. And they were making sure that the net was prepared uh, for the next uh, fishing. And he called them. Again, it was when they were walking, when they were busy, that he called them. And it says, and they immediately left the sheep, and they left their father, and they followed him. What an example we have from these first disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, that immediately they heard the call. They responded, and promptly they followed after the Lord. What Mark and Matthew had recorded, Luke also records, and we find some a real explanation in the case uh, as we read from Luke. We're looking at Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, I read from verse 4. Now, Luke is going to give us the details that are missing in Matthew, are missing in Mark. It's as we put everything together, you hear the whole story. 
you know the whole story and you see everything that are taking place actually this is the reason why these uh, gospels of matthew mark and luke are called the synoptic gospels it's as you read everything you get all the details and you see the whole story of a particular event we're coming to luke chapter 5 and i'm reading from verse 4 luke chapter 5 reading from verse 4 now when he had left speaking he said unto simon launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught and simon answering said unto him master we have toiled all the night and we have taken nothing nevertheless at thy word i will let down the net you can see the response and the attitude you can see the trust and the confidence in Christ even from the very beginning of his call. We had tried that before we caught nothing. We went that direction before we caught nothing. We have labored all the night, we caught nothing. But at thy word, because you are Lord, but at thy word, because you are master, Lord, at your word, we we'll let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their nets break and they beckoned unto their partners which were in the other sheep that they should come and help them and they came and filled both ships and so that they began to sink then when simon peter saw it he fell down at jesus knees saying depart from me for i am a sinful man oh lord you see all those details are missing in matthew and mark and everything is true but to complete the whole story that's why you read all those uh, all those verses and all those chapters together depart from me he said he realized his sin he realized his unworthiness he realized this is not by marriage this is not by qualification this is by the grace and the mercy of god but i'm not worthy to be with you i'm not worthy to stay with you depart from me i'm a sinful man oh lord for he was astonished and all that were with him at the draught of fishes which they are taking so was also james and john the sons of zebedee which were partners with simon and jesus said unto simon fear not from henceforth thou shalt catch men and when they had brought their sheaves to land they forsook all and followed him they forsook all and followed him tonight we're looking at this message in mark chapter 1 verses 14 through to, to, to 20 the conversion and the calling of the first disciples the conversion and the calling of the first disciples to start with what do we call them the first disciples anywhere you go in the gospels and you look at the list of the apostles these four names are the first name names that are reaching before you write all the other age you have one two three four and all the time you have simon peter then you have james then you have john then you have andrew the four of them together before you come to the rest of the disciples or the apostles that's why we refer to them as the first disciples but now we see their conversion and we see their calling we're dividing the message to three parts number one the call by christ the savior christ is savior and this is why he came he came to call people out of their sin he came to call them to repentance he came to call them out of unworthiness he came to call them into the kingdom the call by christ the savior point number two their conversion to christ from sin their conversion was their conversion from from sin they were in darkness he brought them to the light they were in ignorance he brought them into knowledge they were going the way of perdition he brought them to the way of heaven their conversion to christ from sin 
they were converted, they were born again, they were transformed, their lives were changed because of the grace of God that came to them. Their conversion to Christ from sin. Point number three, their consecration in Christ. Their consecration in Christ. You have to be in Christ before you talk about consecration. You have to come into Christ through conversion, through salvation, and through identification with the Lord. There's a, there's a kind of a unity, a kind of connection, a kind of fellowship before you can talk about consecration. But now we're talking about their consecration in Christ with steadfastness. In Christ was steadfastness. That consecration, they were steadfast about it. They continued and continued and continued with the Lord. Their consecration in Christ with steadfastness. Point number one, they are called by Christ the Savior. Let's come back to Mark chapter one. I'm reading from verse 14. And what preceded their call is a preaching by Christ. Look at verse 14 now. After that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. He talks about God. He talks about his sovereignty. He talks about his authority. He talks about his ruling. He talks about his being in charge of a kingdom. And he talks about this kingdom of God. And when you come into that kingdom of God, life becomes different. And was preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. The news of the grace of the kingdom of God. And the news of the power of the kingdom of God. And the news of the open door into the kingdom of God. That's what you do when we're preaching the kingdom. We tell them the kingdom of God is the kingdom of power. And the kingdom of truth. And the kingdom of light. And the door is open for anyone to come in. We bring them the good news of grace the good news of the truth, and the good news of entrance into the kingdom of God. We're looking at Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, reading from verse 35. And Jesus went about all cities and all villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. That's what he did everywhere. He never changed the message. It's about the kingdom. It's about the authority of God. It's about the power of God. And it's about the realm of the rulership of the Almighty God. And it is the gospel he preached all the time. It is the gospel of grace, gospel of Christ, and gospel of righteousness, and the gospel of truth. He preached the good news of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And because of the need of the people, they went everywhere, went everywhere preaching that good news and preaching that gospel of the kingdom unto them. In Luke chapter 4, in Luke chapter 4, reading from verse 42 to verse 44, I see the attitude of Christ and see the compassion of Christ and see the priority of Christ and see the concentration, the focus, the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 4, verse 42, and when it was day, he departed and went into a desert place and the people sought him and came unto him. And they stayed him, and they stopped him, that he should not depart from them. They wanted him to stay in one location. They wanted him to stay just with them. And he said unto them, look at this, look at this, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. It's still the same message, but I need to take it to other people other cities, other villages, other towns. He says, I must, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. Therefore am I sent, not to one place. Therefore am I sent, not to only one person. Therefore am I sent to all the people. And he preached in the synagogues of Galilee, chapter 8 of Luke. Luke chapter 8, verse 1. And it came to pass afterward 
that he went throughout, throughout, throughout every city and village. Every city and village. He went literally everywhere. Everyone must hear this good news. Everyone must know about this good news. Everyone must understand that the kingdom of God has opened doors for everyone. And if I do not go everywhere, they will not hear. He went throughout every city and village preaching and showing the glad tidings, the good news of the kingdom of God. Have you noticed every time, kingdom of God, kingdom of God, they come under the rulership of God, they come under the authority of God, and they come under the control of God as they were converted, as they enter through the open door. And it says, and the 12th, we're coming back to, uh, to Mark chapter 1. We've seen him preaching the gospel. We've seen him and announcing, proclaiming, pronouncing the glad tidings of the kingdom. And now look at what he said in verse 15. In verse 15, that is Mark chapter 1, verse 15, and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. And I wanted them to enter. How do they enter? Number one, repent ye. Number two, believe the gospel. Number one, repent. Number two, turn around. At, uh, number one, repent and turn around. And number two, believe the good news. It's for you. Believe the glad tidings. It's for you. Believe the kingdom of God can be yours even at this time. Believe the gospel. Let's look at the first part. It says, repent ye. And look at Luke chapter 5, and you'll see what Jesus Christ said about that first part of his message. Repent ye. We're looking at Luke chapter 5 and verse 32. Luke chapter 5, verse 32. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He said, anyone I speak to, I came to call sinners to repentance. I might see them in the synagogue. I might see them on the street. I might see them on the seashore. I might see them mending their nets. Anytime I see anyone, because all I've seen and come short of the glory of God, I call them into the kingdom. And the gateway into the kingdom is the way of repentance. He said, I came not to call the righteous, the self-righteous Pharisees, but I came to call sinners to repentance look at luke chapter 13 luke chapter 13 i'm reading from verse 3 in luke chapter 13 verse 3 it says i tell you it's referring to the people that have shown him a terrible thing that had happened in their country in their nation and now jesus was going to tell them at a conclusion about that i tell you nay but except ye repent, ye shall not likewise perish. Repentance for everyone. Turning around for everyone. Turning away from sin for everyone. Look at verse 5 again. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. What does it mean to repent? Look at Ezekiel chapter 18. Repent ye, and then you can believe the gospel. And except you repent, and as for everyone, except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 18, and we're looking at it from verse 30. It says, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel. Everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Look at this, look at this. Repent and turn. Repent and turn. That's what it means to repent. You've been going in the wrong direction and you say, I want to enter the kingdom. I want the gospel of grace to be mine and the gospel of truth to have effect in my life. And Jesus says to do that, to have that, to possess that, repent. And this is what it means, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. 
repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions so iniquity shall not be your ruin it says in verse 31 cast away from you all your transgressions that's what it means to repent and that's what jesus came to call the people to he said from all your transgressions and make you a new heart and a new spirit that's conversion conversion after you repent you believe on the lord and then there's a new heart and there's a new way and there's a new spirit for why will ye die O house of israel for i have no pleasure in the days of him that died says the lord god wherefore turn yourselves and leave ye that word of repentance is so clear in the old testament it was clear and now as jesus came in the new testament that same word of repentance is clear and you remember that before jesus christ left this world he gave that same message he gave that same ministry and he gave that same emphasis to his disciples and to all the believers and this is what we are to emphasize in all the nations of the earth luke chapter 24 luke chapter 24 and i'm reading from verse 45 then open he the understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them thus it is written and thus it behoved christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day and that look at this and that notice this one and that this must be a very central part of the gospel of the kingdom we're preaching a central part of the glad news and the glad tidings and the good news of the kingdom of god we're preaching verse 47 and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name repentance and forgiveness of sins to be preached in his name uh, in all nations in his name among all nations beginning at jerusalem it doesn't stop at jerusalem it continues because this word of repentance is for everyone before anyone can enter into the kingdom before anyone can partake of the provisions of the kingdom and the salvation in the kingdom and the promises of god in the kingdom and become a partaker a possessor there must be repentance look at acts chapter 17 acts chapter 17 i'm reading from the statue acts chapter 17 looking at the statue and the times of this ignorance god winged at but now commanded all men everywhere to repent very clear it says this message of repentance is for everyone that's why christ came that's why he sacrificed for us. That's why he died for us. That's why he has given us the mandate. That's why he has given us the commission. And go and tell everyone they must repent. It says God now commands all men, every man, everywhere to repent. Second Peter chapter 3. In Second Peter chapter 3, I'm reading here from verse 9. Second Peter chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 9. In verse 9, here is the emphasis of the Lord. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards what? Not willing that any should perish. He wants everyone in the kingdom. And thank God you'll be in the kingdom. I said you'll be in the kingdom. He's not willing that any should perish, but that how many people now? All should come to repentance. All should come to repentance. Not only Peter, all. Not only James, all. Not only John, all. Not only Andrew, all. All should come to repentance. We're coming back to Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, I'm reading that verse 15 again. And saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye that's not all that's not enough it's good it's important everyone must repent but just repenting alone doesn't get us into the kingdom and believe the gospel 
and believe the good news. One part, repent. The other part is to believe the gospel. Those two things go, go together. You repent, you believe. You turn away from darkness, you must turn to the light. You turn away from sin, you must turn to the Savior. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 20. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. We're looking at verse 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house. Look at the two things here in verse 21. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Number one, repentance toward God. Number two, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. It's like, uh, you know, you walk with the two legs. You cannot just hop into the kingdom with only one leg. It's like you have two eyes, and you need those two eyes so you can see well into the kingdom. Two hands you have, and those two hands need to be coordinated together so you can make progress and enter into the kingdom. On the one hand, there's repentance. On the other hand, there is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You turn to the Lord and you also believe. You turn away from darkness and you also believe. Acts of the Apostles chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 21. Acts chapter 11. And we're reading from verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. There's a turning to the Lord and there's a believing in the Lord. In First Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1. Here we're reading from verse 7. First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 7. It says so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, look at this, your faith toward God is spread abroad. Your faith toward God is spread abroad so that we need not say, speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we urge unto you, how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Ye turned from idols, that's repentance, and you're serving now the true God. And everybody is talking about your faith. There is faith, there is also repentance. Verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven. Whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. We're coming back to Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, we've seen the call of Christ the Savior and was calling everyone. Before he comes specifically to Peter and to Andrew and to John and to James, he spread the net out whosoever will may come. And he did that by preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He did that by announcing the coming of the kingdom. He did that by giving the conditions of everyone, number one, to repent, number two, to believe, and then when they fulfill that condition, the grace of God will bring them into the kingdom. Point number two now, their conversion to Christ from sin. Their conversion to Christ from sin. I'm reading from verse 16. And we're reading all the way to verse 20. It says, Now, as they walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishers. Look up here for a moment. What we have read in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15 is the general preaching of the gospel. It's uh, telling everybody, not like now, the whole congregation is sitting, and then we proclaim the gospel, and we say, repent and believe ye the gospel. What we are coming to now is personalizing targeting individuals and talking to them in particular, this is for you. 
you can enter the kingdom. And Jesus Christ now spoke to them directly. He saw Simon and he saw Andrew and now he said in verse 17, and Jesus said unto them, come after me. And that's another way of saying repent. That's another way of saying leave what you're doing and leave what you're used to. Forsake your past and start in a new direction and come after me. That's the way of saying turn away from your past and turn unto me. Turn away from your weakness and turn unto my strength. Turn away from your darkness and turn to my light. Turn away from your habit, what you are used to and what you have been doing since you were born. And turn away from what you have taken as a career. And now turn unto me. Leave something behind. It says, and I will make you to become fishers of men. I'll convert you. I'll train you, I'll teach you, and then your life will be totally different. And straight away, they forsook their nets. They forsook everything they were used to in the past, and they followed him. Why did they follow him? Because they believed in him. Why did they follow him? Because a new life is beginning. A new direction is beginning in their lives. And when he had gone a little farther, then he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, also, and they were in the sheep, mending their nets, and straightway he called them, and they led their father, Zebedee. Have you noticed something? You know? If you're going to follow Christ, you must leave something behind. Your life, what has been part of your life? What shall be used to? The things that will hinder your future. The things that will hinder your calling. The things that you cannot match with your new calling and your new life. You must leave everything behind and then follow the Lord. It said they let uh, the Zebedee, their father in the sheep, with the hired servants and they went after him. And they went after him. As you look at this, there are three things to look at. Number one, the call. The call. This is specific call. This is a particular call. And this is the call that came to them individually. Number one, the call. Number two, the confession. As you look at the other writings of the Gospels about this same event, how they left all, how they followed the Lord, there is the confession. Number three is the conversion. Number one, the call. Number one, the call. You've seen it there as they said, come after me. Come after me after me. Uh, let's look uh, at Matthew chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 24. The call come after me. We're looking at Matthew chapter 16 and we're reading from verse 24. It says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, you see that? Come after me. Come after me. And here is how to translate that into your life. How you resolve to apply that, this one into your life. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. He called them, these false disciples, come after me. And our things to consider at that time. They have to deny themselves. This is what I like to do. I'm a fisherman. I love fishing. This is my career. This is my choice. This is the direction I'm going in life. And now he is calling me. Come after me. I have to deny myself of what I had enjoyed from the beginning of my profession. A new life has to start. And the things I was used to, I had to forsake everything and follow this new direction. That happens to everyone. It calls you. There might be friends who have enjoyed nightclubs have enjoyed and there might be activities you have enjoyed and there might be places you have enjoyed going and now he calls you and you have to deny yourself and you, you cannot take that thing and Christ together you cannot take the past and the present together you cannot take what I like to do what my flesh used to you cannot take that and Christ together you have to deny yourself 
and then follow after him because he who will save his life i like to enjoy what i do and this is the doing, and i'm going to keep that you will lose life eternal but if you're going to gain life eternal you give that up look at verse 26 for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world he refuses to leave that world to leave the past and lose his own soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul and when he called them he was calling them out of sin look at john chapter 8 look at john chapter 8 you know what he said he said come after me and that means follow me follow me follow me what does that mean then john chapter 8 i'm reading from verse 11 john chapter 8 verse 11 she said no man lord and jesus says unto her neither do i condemn thee go and sin no more you're taking sin as a career go and sin no more you're taking sin as a lifestyle Go and sin no more. You're taking sin as pleasure, daily pleasure. Go and sin no more. You're taking sin as part of you. You and sin, the sinner and the sin, the sin and the sinner. They've been going together. You're going to patch with that sinner if you're going to follow after me. That's the call. That's the call. Look at verse 20 verse 12 then speak jesus again unto them saying i am the light of the world he that followeth me peter or andrew or james or john or yourself or myself he that followeth after me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life that's following after the lord and thank god we are following the Lord. John chapter 10, verse 27. John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. They are not goats anymore. They are not lions anymore. They are not wild beasts anymore. Their lives, their hearts, their, chain, their, their nature, their direction is changed they sheep, and they hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That's their call. Number two, their conversion. Their conversion. Let's look, confession, rather. Look at uh, Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, their confession. Their confession, Luke chapter 5, we're looking at verse 8. Luke chapter 5, verse 8. I told you already that Luke gives us additional details of what actually happened. Mark just tells us, he called them, follow me, come after me, and they followed. What were things that transpired in that call? Now the confession, Luke chapter 5, verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. That's the confession. I am a sinful man, O Lord. Look at Job. There are people who do not come that far. They think they worship. They don't come that far. They think they uh, believe in the Lord, but they don't come that far. They cover their sin. And they hide their sins. And look at Job chapter 31, verse 33. If I covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom, then I have not confessed. If I cover, if I hide, if I overlook my transgressions like Adam, give me an excuse. Adam, where are you? Excuse. Why did you do that? Excuse. There are many people, they leave the blame of their sin on other people. It's the priest that made me sin. It's my parents that make me sin. It's the community that made me sin. They cover their transgression as Adam. 
and they hide their iniquity in their bosom. What's the result of that? We're looking at um, Proverbs chapter 28, and we're reading from verse 13. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Here, Peter came out clear. Depart from me, I'm a sinful man, O Lord. I'm not worthy to be with you. I'm not worthy to be by your side. I'm not worthy of the kingdom. I'm dirty. I'm defiled. I'm sinful. I'm unworthy. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. But look at this. But whoso confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. He had mercy. The Lord forgave him. We will all have mercy. First John chapter 1. And we're looking at verse 9. First John chapter 1, verse 9. But and if we confess our sins, not if we confess their sins, the sins of our parents, not that. The sins of the society, not that. The sins of our friends, not that. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness it will cleanse us and thank god he has cleansed us already number one the call number two the confession number three the conversion we're coming to luke chapter five luke chapter five and we're reading from verse uh, we're reading from verse 10 now we talk about uh, call we talk about confession we're talking about conversion all these things take place in the life of anyone who is called by the Lord, who repents of sin, and who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. You may not find all the words in the passage at a particular time. Somebody like somebody is saved, at that same time, that person is born again. At that same time, that person is adopted into the family of God. At that same time, that person has eternal life. At that same time, that name is written in the book of life. At that same time, the Spirit of God is bearing testimony with the heart that you are a child of God. But you don't find all those words in a single passage. But those are the things that happen when somebody repents and when somebody is born again and when somebody believes on the Lord Jesus Christ he is called he responds to the call he confesses his sin and then there is conversion we're looking at Luke chapter 5 I'm reading from verse 10 Luke chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 10 it says in verse 10 so also so was also James and John with uh, the sons of Zebedee, uh, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not. He said, I'm a sinner. He said, Fear not. I'm not worthy. Fear not. I cannot be with you. Fear not. Depart from me. A person like me cannot follow after you because I'm a terrible sinner. Fear not. From henceforth, Thou shalt catch men. That's the conversion of that man. And Jesus later made it very clear that nobody can follow him without that conversion. Look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. Matthew chapter 18, we're reading from verse 3. And said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Look at that. If they entered into the kingdom, it's through conversion. And if Peter entered the kingdom, because Jesus was presenting the kingdom to them, to James, to John, to Andrew, and to Peter. He wanted them to enter. And to enter, he had told them already, repent and believe in the gospel. And we know that he entered. Why? Because he said, fear not. From henceforth, 
you'll catch men from henceforth you'll even be not just a citizen of the kingdom but a servant a worker a leader an apostle in the kingdom if he is in the kingdom he must have been converted very soon to you except ye be converted and become as little children ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven and peter himself remembering that when he told when he spoke to other people he made use of that same word repent acts of the apostles chapter 3 acts of the apostles chapter 3 and i'm reading from verse 19 acts chapter 3 verse 19 repent ye therefore and be converted you see how connected they are if you repent you believe on the lord jesus christ you're converted and peter repented and believed on the lord jesus christ he was converted he confessed to sin and then jesus said fear not i forgive you fear not i bring you into the kingdom conversion took place and now peter himself says repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when you are converted all your sins you ever committed, the small ones and the big ones, the common ones and the common ones, the habitual ones and the occasional ones, all those sins are blotted away. They are blotted away from the record of God. They are blotted away from your record. They are blotted away from your heart. They are no more in your life. They are totally blotted away. I thought somebody will say, Amen that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That's the kingdom. That's the kingdom. The kingdom of God is a time of renewal. It's a period of refreshing. And it's a situation that all the weariness of the past, all the problems of the past, and all the heat and the confusion, commotion of the past, all that is gone. And now there is refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Look at verse 26. Unto you first God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away in turning away in turning away every one of you from his iniquities every one of you from his iniquities turning them away that's the conversion come to james chapter 5 james chapter 5 peter has spoken about com conversion let's listen to james uh, talking about conversion you remember the people were studying about the first disciples we have peter we have Andrew, we have James, and we have John, and they all understood conversion. Why? It happened to them. Why? The Spirit of God painted each in their hearts. Conversion. Look at uh, verse 19, James chapter 5, verse 19. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, if any of you do hear from the truth, if somebody was not in the truth, if somebody has gone away from the truth, if somebody has been in error, if somebody has been in darkness, if somebody has been in iniquity, if somebody has been living in sin, is departing from the Lord, away from the truth, and one converts him, bringing him to repentance, believing of the Lord Jesus Christ, having salvation, having a new life, having eternal life, receiving forgiveness of sin, and receiving freedom from sin. That's the conversion. Look at verse 20. Let him know that he which converteth, that's the word again, the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death. At the point of salvation, that's the conversion. And the soul is saved from eternal death and shall hide, shall cover, shall remove a multitude of sins. All the sins the person had committed, since that person was born, all that sin is removed and taken away. There is the call, number one. There is the conversion, number two. There is the conversion, number three. And it's so simple. And if you have not been converted, if you are not in the kingdom yet, very simple. Number one step, repent. Number one step, turn around. 
Number one step, turn away from darkness. Number one step, turn away from your past. Number one step, take all your past, all your sins of the past in, a, in, a, in one bundle and say, I drop everything. I turn away from everything you know, and now have faith in Christ and turn to Christ and say, I accept you. I receive you. I take you as my Savior. I turn away from darkness. I turn to the light. Salvation will be yours. Conversion will be yours. And the grace of God will be yours in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three. Their consecration in Christ was steadfastness. We're coming to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 17. Mark chapter 1, verse 17. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Look at verse 18. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. They forsook their nets and followed him. They did something. And you have to do something. Christ died on the cross of Calvary. He sacrificed for your sin and is willing to give you eternal life, salvation, conversion, a place in the kingdom of God. But you do something. They, they forsook their nets and they followed him. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, and straightway he called them and they left their father. They left somebody and they left something. It says they left their father in the sheep and with they left their father their father Zebedee in the sheep with the hired servants and went after him and went after him. There are three things here. Number one, they forsook all. They forsook all. You see, am I supposed to forsake anything, anything that will hinder the kingdom participant? Anything that will hinder the kingdom progress. Anything that will hinder the kingdom pleasure. Anything that will hinder the call the Lord has given you. For you, it may not be nets that you use in catching fish. For you, it may not be a tool. For you, it might be a partnership. For you, it might be a particular thing you are selling. You are selling alcohol. You are selling cigarette. That might be your own case that you have to leave that thing. For you, it might be the utensils of the devil, the tools of the devil. For you, it might be another thing. It might be your registration in a gang, in an occult group. But everyone has to leave something behind. If you are coming to the Lord, number one, they forsook all. Look at this, Mark chapter 10. And Peter is going to remind us that it's not just the net, it's everything that will contradict their call. Everything that will not be compatible with the call of God upon their lives. Are you a child of God? Look at your life. Is there somebody, is there something, a relationship which is not, in, uh, which is not compatible with the calling the Lord has given you? you have to forsake something. In Mark chapter 10, verse 28, Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and we have followed thee. We have left all and we have followed thee. You have to leave something and it's all, all. Every sin that contradicts the call of God in your life. In verse 29, And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that has left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time houses, brethren, and sisters, and mother, and children, and lands with persecution, and in the life to come, tell me, eternal life. But you see, they forsook all. They forsook all. We're looking at Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. We're reading from verse 33. Luke chapter 14, verse 33. So likewise, whosoever be he of you that forsaketh not 
all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. How about that? All that he has, yes, all that he has that will contradict his kingdom call. All that he has that will cancel holiness in his life. All that he has that will make him to be remembering the past, remembering the past and the past all the time. All that he has that will make, that will make him to be hearing those dirty jokes and those defiling things. Anything that you have that contradicts what God wants in your life, then you say the kingdom of God is more important and my peace in the kingdom is so important and my uh, enjoyment of the kingdom is so important and anything that contradicts that I must forsake Philippians chapter 3 and I'm reading from verse 21 Philippians chapter 3 we're reading from verse 21 it tells us Philippians chapter 3 and verse, uh, verse, uh, verse uh, Philippians chapter 3 uh, verse 7, excuse me, verse 7. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, it says, But what things were gain to me, those I counted loss for Christ. The things that were gained to me, you understand that he had a religion, the religion of the Pharisees, and he profited so much in that. But now he's following after the Lord, and he couldn't keep the Pharisees. He couldn't keep the association with the Sanhedrin. He couldn't keep all those things that he enjoyed as a Jewish person, as a Pharisee. He couldn't keep them, and they were given to him. They gave him authority. They gave him letters of authority to go anywhere and do anything. But he said, they were against to me, but now I counted them lost for Christ, yea, doubtless. And I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus us my lord since the lord called him anything that will contradict that call anything that will slow him down anything that will hinder impede his progress in the kingdom of god all those things he had to forsake for him it was association with the pharisees for you it may not be association with the pharisees allow me to you know something very simple you, you go to a barber for example where you barb your head and they always tell dirty dirty jokes dirty dirty jokes and they'll make fun of christ and make fun of the gospel and make fun of the church and tear the bible to pieces while the man is barbing your head is uh, talking about something hellish and something devilish you say well this is one of the things i have to give up or maybe you're a lady and where you go to plant your ear they are talking rubbish and they are talking dirty dirty things they are helping you and they are doing your ear but they are also saying some things that are very dirty and naughty so there are things that may be peculiar to you things may be peculiar to me or to Paul or to Peter that we have to give up and you give up those things so that you can make progress in the kingdom you make progress in Jesus name I have an amen in the house. It says, Ye doubtless, and I count all things but laws for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27. Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm reading from verse 27. It says in verse 27, By faith he forsook Egypt. You cannot be in Egypt and Canaan at the same time. God had called Moses to lead the children of Israel to the land of Canaan, the land of promise. And he had been in Egypt. In fact, there was a greater thing awaiting him in Egypt. If he had agreed, if he had remained the son of of the daughter of Pharaoh. He would have become a Pharaoh himself, a king in Egypt. But no, he couldn't stay with that because that will contradict his calling. What's your calling? It's called you to eternal life. What's your calling? It's called you to the service of the Lord. What's your calling? It's called you to take some people out of their sin and to take them to the kingdom of God. What are the things in your life that will hinder that? You have to forsake them. That is part of your consecration. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seen him who is invisible. Number one, they forsook all. Number two, 
they followed him. They followed him. We're coming back to Mark. And as we come to Mark chapter 1, you will see he had told them, come after me. They forsook all and they followed him. We're looking at Mark chapter 1 and I'm reading from verse 18. Mark chapter 1 and we're reading from verse 18. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him and followed him. Following the Lord, what's the implication of that? We're looking at John chapter 10. John chapter 10, they followed him. And for you, what's the implication? Look at it in the word of God. They followed him. They forsook all. If they stopped there, that should not be enough. Because there are people in the world too. If they see that something is against their career, they forsake that. Something is against their progress, they forsake that. Something is against their happiness in their marriage, they forsake that. But after forsaking all, there's the next step. They followed him. Look at John chapter 10, verse 4, verse 5. When he put it forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. They must follow the shepherd. If you have taken him as your savior, you have taken him as your shepherd, you follow him, for they know his voice. Verse 5, and a stranger will they not follow. You will not follow false doctrine and Christ at the same time. You will not follow tradition and Christ at the same time. You will not follow a stranger, strange doctrine, strange fire, strange worship, and follow Christ at the same time. If you are forsaking what will hinder your progress in the kingdom, now you follow after Christ, and the stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of a stranger. First Peter chapter 2. In First Peter chapter 2, now that you are forsaking all, you've turned your back on the past, and you're now a child of God, you follow Christ. In uh, First Peter chapter 5, verse 21, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ has suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye shall follow his steps. Ye should follow his steps. You know, this was written after Jesus Christ had died. After Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. After Jesus Christ has gone to heaven. And it is Peter writing this. He said, you know what we did? We forsook all and we followed him. But we saw him face to face. We saw him in the natural. We saw him in the physical. Now you cannot see him. He has gone to heaven. But his life has been recorded for you. The story of his life. The direction of his life. And the attitude and the character and the lifestyle. Everything has been written for you. Although you cannot see him now in the physical, in the natural. All the examples they are laid down that he follow his steps and so anything you're doing you ask yourself what will jesus do follow after his steps you find your neighbors and they are you're saying something negative and something bad they abuse the nation they abuse the church they abuse the leaders they abuse everyone and you have a tendency to say well maybe they are right they have a reason for saying that they have a reason for cutting down this and cutting down that after all these people are bad but before you join them, you ask yourself, what will Jesus say? When Jesus was here on earth, what did he say about Herod? What did he say about Pilate? What did he say about, you know, the leaders? And then you say, what will Jesus say? And then you find other people, they're doing something here and there, and you have the tendency of, maybe I should follow them, maybe I should do like they're doing. But before you do anything, you ask yourself, what will Jesus do? Because now, number one, they forsook all. Number two, they followed him. I pray you'll follow the Lord. And if you're doing something, uh, and, you, and then the Spirit of God tells you, why are you doing that? Christ will not do that. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. And immediately you are cleansed in the blood of the Lamb, and you stop that thing, uh, you will follow Christ. If you go in a particular direction, and the Spirit of God reminds you, alerts you, 
how are you doing that? Will Christ do that? Then you check yourself. Oh Lord, I'm sorry. And the Lord will forgive you. And you walk in the direction Christ would have walked in Jesus' name. They followed him. I will follow him. Look at Revelation chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 4. Revelation chapter 14 verse 4. These are they which are not defiled with women. For they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Remember, Christ was now in heaven. Remember, the Lamb of God is now in heaven. Remember, it's not on earth. Now, this revelation time, and yet it talks about the people that follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. He goes to evan in evangelism, you follow. He goes in encouraging, uh, you know, the discord, you follow. He goes in healing the sick, you follow. He goes everywhere, still doing good by spirit, and you follow in his steps. And he says, These are the who are redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. In their mouth they is found, was found no girl. Why? Because in the mouth of Jesus there was no girl. There was no deception, but they are without fault before the throne of God. I pray the Lord will accomplish it in your life, in my life, in our lives together in Jesus' name. Number one, they followed, they forsook all. Number two, they followed him. Number three, they fed on his word. They fed on his word. That's what they were following. It's because of the word of his mouth. That's why they followed him. So they could feed on the word of God. John chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 67. John chapter 6 verse 67. And th then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the word of eternal life, and we believe and assure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living, of the living God. They fetch on his word. You forsake all, anything that will hinder your progress in the kingdom. You follow him, everything he will do, that's what you'll do. And you feed on his word. John chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 8. John chapter 17, verse 8. For I have given them the words which thou givest me. I have given them the words which thou givest me. And they have received them. And they have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou did send me. Look at uh, verse 14 there. In verse 14, I have given them the word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Even as I'm not of the world. They fetch on his word. But that, that was when he was alive. Now he's no more here on earth. He has gone to heaven. What am I to do today? Can I still find his word today? And what am I to do with that word? Colossians chapter, six, chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 16. Colossians chapter 3 verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. He's gone to heaven. Is at the right hand side of the Father right now, and yet His word is still with us. The words were reaching down, His messages were reaching down, His doctrines are reaching down, and the words that bring salvation, and the words that lead to sanctification, and the words of His power, baptism in the Holy Ghost, and His word on marriage, and His word on evangelism, and His word on the rapture, and His word on coming again, His word that will encourage us, His word that will make us live a clean life you are clean through the words that have spoken unto you that word is still with us today let the word of christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual song singing with grace in your heart to the lord and whatsoever you do in word 
you've had his word, now your own word. You've had his message, now your own message. You've had everything he proclaimed, now your own proclamation. And everything whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Let your life and let your word give praise and glory unto the Lord. Those words that Jesus spoke, that they fed on at that time, that word is still active today, and that word is still with us today. And it tells us in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 24, verse 35. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Those words are in the Bible right there. The whole Bible, the word of God is given unto us now and it says heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away. What are we to do with this word today? Number one, hear the call of Christ your Savior. And he, he preaches to us. He still declares the word to us. He still tells us the kingdom of God is Satan. Now the door is open. Repent and believe ye the gospel. If you have not entered the kingdom yet, hear the words of Christ. You enter the kingdom today in Jesus' name. If you have entered, you will abide. If you have entered, you will stay. If you have entered, you'll bring other people to come to you in Jesus' name. There will be evidence of conversion in your life. Your call will be very clear. Your confession will be very clear. Your conversion will be very clear. The people around you will, will be able to tell about your faith, how you turned away from idols and you turned from your past and you turned to the living God. We will we'll see that your life marks you out as a believer. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I'm a believer. I say thank you, Lord. I'm a believer. I thank God for you. You're a believer. You remain a believer in Jesus' name. Anything hindering your progress in the kingdom, hindering your, hindering your partnership and your, your profession of faith in the kingdom, you might have to examine your life, examine your, examine your character, forsake all. They forsook all and they followed him from this day. In every minute detail of your life, you will follow the Lord. I will follow the Lord. I will follow the Lord. Where well, we've made mistakes before and we deviated and we didn't fully follow the Lord, the grace of God is available tonight. He'll forgive every one of us in Jesus' name. And now we continually feed on His word. Feed on His word. You'll be strong. Feed on His word. You'll be an overcomer. Feed on His word. And eventually He'll give you the heavenly manner and then you'll be in the, in the paradise of God and you'll eat of that tree of life in the paradise of God eventually in Jesus' name. Forsaking all, following Him, feeding on His word. I pray the word of God will have its effect in every one of our life tonight in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Take these things to the Lord in prayer. See what Peter became after he followed the Lord. See what he became after he responded to the Lord. Who knows what will become in the kingdom of God as you respond to the Lord today. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord and say, Lord, here am I. Lord, here am I. I forsake all. I follow you. I'll feed on, it, on your word.